Our call to worship this morning is Acts chapter 1, the first two verses. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. Let's sing together. Would you stand with me? It's number 38 in your hymnal if you like. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's stand as we sing, Blessed be the name. as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. And uh, we thank and praise the Lord for his word this morning. Um, in about a moment, in a moment, we're going to take an offering uh, for Hannah. Uh, Hannah has been looking for a short-term missions trip for years, uh, for the last several years. Uh, it's been on her heart. Uh, she shared with me several years ago, pre-COVID, uh, that she just really was sorting out whether God was calling her to full-time service as a missionary and uh, she's wanted for several years to take a short-term trip. Uh, that trip has a number of purposes, uh, the first of which, uh, I think in Hannah's mind, is to be of service to others. Uh, but right there along with it, 1A is sorting out God's will, uh, whether full-time missions is what he wants, whether full-time missions where she's going is what he wants, and uh, trying to sort his will. And um, we don't want Hannah anywhere else but here. But I'll be honest, that selfishness talking, uh, she's an asset here. Uh, when people talk to me about wanting to serve the Lord somewhere else, my first is encouragement is serve the Lord where you are. And from day one, Hannah's done that here. And uh, we've been thrilled to see it. And she's done nothing but increase uh, her uh, areas of service to the Lord in and around us. And we're thrilled with that. Uh, she had a, a missions there through folks that met, we were she was able to meet through camp uh, with uh, BIMI uh, out of Chattanooga, Ch a mission agency out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, she was going to take a trip to the Philippines, and uh, there were, at one point, I think eight or nine people were supposed to go on that trip. It came down to Hannah and one other person, and it kind of felt like that person was probably going just to take care of Hannah. It also kind of sounded like it was going to be mission sightseeing 
sometimes short-term trips, and the folks that are with us next week will share their heart in this regard too, but sometimes short-term trips are just to let you see another place and you get to look at ministry as if you're looking in the windows at it and you can kind of window shop at, at ministry. And uh, Hannah's heart was to be somewhere where she could serve, where she could do something, uh, where she could kind of be in the nitty gritty of things. And so uh, the fellow that, that was in charge of that trip just kept asking around and he knew people. And uh, there's a pastor named Pastor uh, Barnhouse, uh, from, also from Tennessee, uh, who used to minister in Zambia. And he's come back stateside and he makes several trips a year to Tennessee with groups. There are people going from uh, Rochester, New York, from Missouri, from Tennessee, and from Rutland, Mass. And uh, the folks from Rochester are flying out of Logan, so they're gonna be driving right by here. Uh, if there's a couple extra vehicles parked here uh, in a couple weeks, that's why. I don't know if that's gonna work out yet or not, but we've offered it uh, to them so they're not paying for parking. Uh, and uh, poor Hannah got an earlier flight, so somebody's gonna have to get up wicked early to take her to Logan. Uh, but uh, the only good news with that is the other folks will fit in my car uh, if I do need to drive them. But anyway, you be praying for the trip in general, especially for Hannah. Uh, pray for safety throughout. Uh, pray for good connections, uh, flight from Logan to New York and then across the ocean. Uh, pray that God will uh, prepare the way before her. And then her heart is that God will use her and that God will inform her future decisions uh, because of this trip. Uh, her, her, when she first brought this up with the previous trip, her, some of her first words to me were, I really don't need help, I've been saving money and I, wanted, I, I have it to do this. And my words right back to her were, ha ha, uh, we wanna help. And uh, we have a history of helping our young folks go on trips. Uh, we've done for Michalina, we've, we've done for Will and others, and uh, we've been delighted to have a part. We wanna have a part in this too. And so uh, that's what we're after. So if I could have a couple of us. Uh, see we're uh, offering for him. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for a beautiful day. We thank you, Lord, for Hannah. We thank you, Lord, for her faithfulness here. Uh, it's been an absolute joy to watch her grow up here, to watch her grow in the world here. Uh, it's been a delight to see her step up and serve in so many different areas in our church. And she has proven herself in that uh, Father, selfishly, we'd love to keep her around here, but we uh, would never want to hold her back from what you have for her. And as she seeks your will, uh, as she seeks to serve you short term and consider serving you long term, uh, Lord, give her great wisdom, give her safety, uh, open her eyes to everything you want her to see, and use her, Lord, in this trip. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that we can have a part in it, and we pray that, that all of it would honor and glorify you in its every part. We pray in Jesus' precious name.
To breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone And glory fills the streets To look upon The one who bled to save me And walk with him For all eternity There will be a day songs of faith we've sang through doubt and fear in the end we know that it was worth it when he returns to wipe away our tears there will be a day when all will bow before him join the resurrection and 
stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations will sing worthy is the lamb who was slain forever he shall Amen. What a day that will be. Amen. Children are dismissed to junior church at this time. The rest of you would join me in Luke chapter 1. I should say if the kids at heart would join me at Luke chapter 1. Let's have a word of prayer as we dig in. Heavenly Father, thank you for everything. You've given us everything we need to know in your word. You've given us life and health. You've given your very son for us. You've given us the hope of eternity with you in heaven, joint uh, heirs with Jesus Christ himself. Oh, what a day that will be when we can look at you a person and cry with the angels, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Father, I pray earnestly in the remains of this hour that you would focus our hearts upon your word, uh, that, Lord, you would free us of the distractions, uh, the cares and anxiousness of the world, that, Father, you would help us not to merely see this as an academic thing, but that we would see what you have for us, even in introductory words, uh, that is for us and will change us if we but let it. Uh, Father, open our hearts to your word, we pray in Jesus' name. I have looked forward for a long time to preaching the gospel of Luke. I have done, I have covered Luke in survey classes. I've never taught or preached through the whole book. I've taught the parables of Luke. We're going to take note here in a moment that Luke has more parables than anybody uh, by far, uh, more miracles than anybody by far. Uh, there's a lot of unique content in Luke. Um, I am trying to let Luke's introduction speak for itself in these first few verses, uh, and at the same time to give some background of what makes Luke special so that we know how to read Luke and study Luke and listen to Luke to the best effect. And so uh, try not to be merely academic here, but to draw our introduction out of Luke's introduction, largely, and uh, to see where it all fits. Uh, who was Luke? Well, we just heard his name in Colossians chapter 4, as Paul was taking care of housekeeping, if you will, and sending greetings along, uh, he mentions Luke. 
Uh, there are two things about Luke that show up there in the passage we were just in in Colossians chapter 4. Uh, one of those things is that Luke is a Gentile. He's not Jewish. Uh, he surprise, might surprise people because he's the only uh, known Gentile to pen a New Testament book. So this is very unique to him. Uh, I remember I, I fell in when Kim and I were newlyweds. I, I fell into doing carpentry work, doing a lot of siding jobs for a lot of Jews who were from Brooklyn. They were actually Eastern European Jews whose families had escaped the war. They ended up in Brooklyn and then they all retired to the Poconos together. And they treated me like family. And one to the other to the other, I did their siding. And, you know, they would invite me to lunch and they would give me gifts and they were very generous and treated me terrific. And I says, you know, you're you're being really nice uh, to a Gentile like me. To which the lady looked at me and she said, you were telling me with a name like Nathan Haman, you're not Jewish, you know? I never felt like I got the same treatment after that, you know? Uh, but yeah, it sounds Hebrew, but it ain't. And uh, my parents liked the meaning of my first name and my last name is just an interesting little blend of English culture and German culture and that's what you get. Uh, but uh, yeah, you never guess what my family did for a living back in the day. Uh, it could be worse, there were hay monkeys. That was the little guy who hung on the front of a carriage and threw hay or straw down in front of the horses on a muddy road. Uh, so at least it's hay man and not hay monkey and I'll take it. Uh, but anyway, in Colossians, he refers to, to those that are with him who are of the circumcision. And that list didn't include Luke. And then a few verses later in chapter, uh, in verse uh, 14, he mentions Luke separately as the beloved physician. And so what do we know about Luke? Well, one, importantly, we know that he's Gentile. Uh, there's some other things. Uh, he says, um, talks about the land that Judas bought with his blood money, the 30 pieces of silver. He refers to the meaning of the term akeldama as in there, that is the Jew's proper tongue. So he's speaking third person, if you will, about Jews and Jewish culture and Jewish language. And so Luke never pretends. He's writing to Theophilus, who is also a Greek man with a very Greek name. And so it's important for us to recognize, as mostly Gentiles, right, us, uh, in, in the New Testament church age, this book is written to a Gentile population about Jesus Christ. So you think it might have something for us? I'd suggest it has everything for us. And so it's important that we see it that way. And so Luke, uh, we know, of course, here that he is Gentile. We also know that he's a doctor. Uh, we're going to see certain things that he gives more emphasis than any other writer. Uh, but first and foremost, I, I want you to have in mind that he is, his research, which is what the book is based on, we'll talk about that in a moment, and his presentation and the very organized nature of his presentation had to do with who he was and what he was trained to be. He was a doctor. And Paul calling him the beloved physician, I guess he's someone that people liked and cared about. Uh, he was beloved. Typically, the people that we love are people that are loving, lovable, and so it kind of speaks to his personality. I like to think that Luke was the kind of doctor who would actually listen to you when you talked, who would actually think about your problem and not just read protocol. I am fed up. Now that my body's starting to let me down, I am fed up with protocol already. And I want a doctor, I'm, I'm looking for a new one if you've got suggestions. I want a doctor that thinks for his or herself and that doesn't just take what the last journal article said or what the insurance company wants. Uh, I got bigger problems than that. Uh, I take it that Luke is that kind of man. I think Luke was, was a physician not to make a buck, but a physician because he had, he had talent and because he wanted to help people, the beloved physician. Uh, how do we know it was Luke? Well, um, I tried in vain. I, I wish I was more artistic or at least better with, with computer graphics. Uh, to, to give you two, book, two volumes, two books side by side on a shelf. If you can picture these two books side by side on a shelf, we're seeing the spine. They have the same beautiful cover. They have different names, titles, but they have the same name under author. And it's a beautiful two volume set that sits on the shelf. Volume one is the gospel according to Luke and volume two is the book of Acts. 
Uh, Acts has historically been called the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, some folk would say it would be better called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but the fact is, Acts is a book of history. It's a book that tells us about the Apostles. The Apostles, we've talked about it often, they're unique to all history. They're unique to the history of Christ Church. They're unique in that Jesus himself gave them his own authority. They were to work in, as his proxies. He gave them power of attorney. They had that level of authority on earth. And they were empowered supernaturally, profoundly by the Holy Spirit. They were of a unique number, and it was only in the first generation of the church. There are no apostles today, nor will there be. Uh, it was a temporary thing to get the church going, and these were unique men, not popes of any kind, but given Jesus' own authority and the Holy Spirit's own power. And so it's a precious thing. And so the book of Acts tells about these men. Uh, if you read the book of Acts carefully, you'll find the first person plural shows up in several places, the word we. And if you compare what we know from the epistles and when books were written and who was Paul, as we saw at the end of Colossians and just referenced, he talks about who is with him and so forth. There's only a couple of men that could have been the, that could have said we, including Paul, the other co companions and so forth. And Luke is the one who comes out and he fits in all places. And then we have the fact that in chapter 1, the first couple of verses of Acts, his introduction refers back to volume 1. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. And he goes on to give his purpose for the book of Acts. Here's what happened in the days of the apostles. And it's a fantastic read. Take time in the book of Acts often. Uh, see how the Lord built his church and everything. It's, it's exciting to me. Uh, I remember as, as a kid when we moved to California, it was a major league culture shock for me moving to California. Uh, moving from a little town in southern Indiana where, uh, you know, I, I had one friend uh, who, whose mom was from South America, and I think every other friend that I had there was Caucasian. I didn't know there was a world outside of, you know, Boonville, Indiana. Moved to Northern California. By the time I was in seventh grade, I think I was one of three white kids in my class. Everybody was from everywhere. Came to a church, there was no boys my age, but there were young adult men in the church that took an interest in me and looked out for me. Uh, I, I loved it. You know, if you haven't seen Seamus lately, I look up to Seamus and he's got a very deep voice. Uh, but when Seamus was a young guy around here, there were men in the church that took him under wing. It was a beautiful thing to watch. And I remember very fondly the men that looked out for me. One of them was a fellow named Frank Ruiz. And Frank would, would take me, he, he belonged to a place that had a swimming pool, and he'd take me to, to swim and, and to go to a workout gym when I was a young preteen, and I thought that was the coolest thing ever. He became my Sunday school teacher, and the, the subject was the book of Acts. And I remember the delight and excitement on his face. He says, Acts is my favorite book in the whole Bible. Let me tell you about Acts, Nathan. And he told me about, you know, running and joining a chariot, running to catch that chariot that we talked about last Sunday evening at baptism, and actually running to do it, and, and all the action in the book of Acts. And I'll tell you what, it was kind of infectious, and he taught the class well, and I've loved Acts ever since. And so the beginning of Acts refers back to volume one, and so we can be quite confident of Luke writing both of these books. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. They're written by the same well-educated, decidedly Greek man, uh, or by and to, this, uh, by Luke, a well-educated Greek man, to Theophilus, a well-educated, uh, highly regarded Greek man. And Luke's long-term association with Paul would lend a apostolic authority uh, to both of the books. Uh, he was discipled by Paul, became a close co-worker and trusted confidant of Paul, and uh, that gives a lot of authority too. And as we'll talk about canonicity in a minute, that was one of the things that, that spoke to why Luke was truly deserving of being in Scripture and in our Bible. Uh, talking briefly about Theophilus, we know that he's a Gentile man. Uh, he's of high rank. Most excellent Theophilus is in many of the manuscripts of Acts 1-1. 
uh, most excellent Theophilus would speak to him, uh, being a man of, of some standing and rank, probably a political leader. Uh, there is a tradition that teaches he was perhaps the governor in Syrian Antioch, but we don't know that concretely. Scripture doesn't tell us we don't have hard and fast record, but it's a persistent uh, tradition, and so I give you the possibility of it right there. And um, here we get to really to Luke's introduction. Verse 1, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. And so he references the other manuscripts that are around. Other people have written about Jesus. There's probably quite a lot that's being said, obviously, but also written about Jesus and about the gospel story. And so uh, I think personally, looking at the timelines and what we know that we know, given the, where he came into the story and so forth, my take would be, I can't say it concretely, but I, I'm pretty sure Luke is the third of, of the Gospels we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Uh, I th whether or not they were written in that order, I couldn't tell you, but I would suggest that Luke is probably third. Uh, by most accounts, John was written much later. Given the, the, what was included in the book, I think John wrote to be supplemental uh, to the other three Gospels that were more parallel, not completely parable, but much more parallel uh, to each other. We call them the synoptic Gospels. They see together. Uh, they parallel themselves to a, to a great extent. Uh, and then John writes to complement that. So when Luke says, uh, many have undertaken to compile an account of these things that happened among us, that were handed down to us, many have done it, but I felt compelled to do this for you, and I think he could, we could easily put in parentheses, and for me. Uh, this was how his mind worked. He wanted to study it for himself. Dear believer, study for yourself. Uh, don't be at the whim of other people and what they tell you. Uh, I, I appreciate your trust, and it, it, it's important to me. I appreciate your trust, and I don't want to offend that trust in any way, shape, or form. But my teaching from this pulpit, when I open the Word to you in any location, in any passage, it ought to hold up to the scrutiny of the Word of God. And if it doesn't, you better let me hear about it. And if that becomes a continued problem, you better find another preacher. Uh, you need to be in the Word of God for yourself. Make a study of it for yourself. It will mean so much more to you. I've said it so often. If the only good meal you get from Scripture, the only meal you get from Scripture is Sundays at 11.30, you're not healthy. You're malnourished. You need to be in the Word of God daily for yourself. You need to search it to see if these things are so like the Bereans did. You need to be like Luke and put it together for yourself. And that's very much what he did and passed along to Theophilus. Um, there were other written records, probably other than Matthew and Mark. I would suggest that Matthew and Mark were around, whether Luke had them in his hand or not, I'm not sure, but they were around by then. Uh, there were other accounts, and these accounts were not Scripture. Uh, they weren't part of the canon. I use the word here, canonicity, in your notes. Uh, canonicity doesn't mean it goes bang when you light the fuse. The canon, in this case, the word canon with, with one N in the middle, speaks to a measuring rod. And essentially, the measuring rod is inspiration. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That is, God breathed out all Scripture. And so that is the test. That is the ultimate test, whether this is the very Word of God. How do people come up with that? How do they determine if it was really inspired or not? Well, there are some tests of canonicity. In general, there, it had to be someone that was well known to the church, an apostle or someone right in the thick of it, like James, the Lord's brother, half-brother. Uh, someone tied closely to an apostle, like Luke here, where Paul gives a bit of authority to what Luke writes. That's usually in the idea. Certainly, it could have no error. There could be no mistakes, there could be no false teaching, there could be no contradictory teaching and still have it be part of the canon. Because if God breathed it out, it couldn't possibly have error because it came out of the perfection of God himself. 
And then we look at uniqueness. I, I mentioned it in Sunday school this morning. You know, people have good ideas. And maybe I think I can do it better. And so we've seen it these days with social media. We've seen it with air, things like Airbnb and Uber. And I don't know enough to tell you the difference between Uber and Lyft. Uh, but evidently the fel folks at Lyft had it in mind that they could make a living at this too. But typically for something to work, it has to either be better than what exists already or be notably, notably different and meet a different need. My suggestion to you is not that Luke is better than Matthew and Mark, uh, so forth, but that it is unique. There is a lot in Luke that is unique. And Luke, as a doctor, Luke as a Gentile, he's going to put some focus, more focus in certain places than in others, or than that others might have in those same places. And so it's important for us to see it that way. Uh, due to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you did not need to be an eyewitness to write the gospel message. You didn't have to be an eyewitness to everything. Mark wasn't there for everything, but Mark was related to people, and he had good friends that were there. He had a relationship with Peter, a relationship with Barnabas, and so forth. And so this gave authority to it, but the Holy Spirit superintended Mark so that what he wrote down was in Mark's words, because humans understand other humans, right? And so they bring their own. Matthew was a tax collector, right? Do you know which gospel says the most about money? Matthew. Shocking, isn't it? Uh, we'll talk in a moment here about things that Luke included, but inspiration. No prophecy came by any man's opinion by himself. No prophecy came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were carried, as they were literally borne along by the Holy Spirit. So we believe that God superintended human authors so that using their own individual personalities, their own vocabularies, they both composed and recorded without error God's word to man in the words of the original autographs of scripture, as in the first copy from their hand was the perfection as if it came from God's own hand itself. And so 2 Peter, 1 Peter, they, they bear that out, as does 2 Timothy in several places. Uh, he was a recipient of trustworthy oral tradition. Uh, this evening, I'm going to take us to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 at verse 23 as we come to the communion table. And Paul says, I, you know, he's going to say, I'm going to share with you. Matter of fact, as I'm doing this, uh, let me do it right. And I'll do it in New American Standard and not in uh, King James like usual. I confessed to someone lately that the reason I do communion in uh, King James is because it's mostly memorized, and when I try to read it in something else, I usually mess it up. Uh, but here we have 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, uh, and again, took bread and gave thanks and broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. And so as the Lord gave me, I gave you. There are many other passages that talk about that. Uh, Jude, uh, Jude verse three, um, shouldn't take me but a minute to get to that one. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing to that appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Again, this speaks to an oral tradition carefully given. If we have something to give somebody that's important in our day because we can do it as easily as pulling our phone out of our pocket and using our thumbs or pulling out a pen or a pencil, we write a thing down or type it out. We talk to each other and I'm of an age, I, I'm of that middle age. I can text, and sometimes it's kind of handy. I'm done for the night, I'm sitting in my easy chair, I need to communicate something to somebody and I'd rather not start a phone call. Okay, I'm like the young bucks, I'll, I'll use my thumbs. Uh, if I'm getting or giving an address, boy, text is good for that because it's always good to have it written and now I know I can tap it and it'll hypertext and put it to my maps and now I've got directions and that's all right. So we like things in, in written form, but in their day, paper wasn't just go to Staples and buy it, uh, put, a, put an order to Amazon. It was extraordinarily hard to come by, and so everything was oral before it was written down. 
and it was carefully given, and we have to believe that God preserved his word throughout. Um, his purpose, his purpose uh, and approach here, his purpose uh, be in your notes to establish Theophilus in the Christian faith. Verse 4, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. You've been taught a lot of things orally. You've heard a lot of things. You've heard a lot of things from a lot of people. Let me give it to you in its order. The word he gives here could mean just listed in orderly fashion, but it seems most often to be used of consecutively or chronologically. And, and that would really describe how he writes. For the overwhelming most part, there's really no doubt that he's writing in chronological order. But he's saying, let me put these things down for you. So you get it. You've had people tell you this, and they've told you that. They've told you this, and they've told you that. And now, to have it in writing, to have it carefully researched, to have it carefully written, to have it organized well, this is a resource that he's put in Theophilus' hands, and honestly, in ours. Uh, that you may know the exact truth of the things you've been taught. He had investigated all of this very carefully for himself. You remember Awana's theme verse? 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Awana, that stood for approved workmen are not ashamed, A-W-A-N-A. And here, we're to study God's word for ourself. And Luke gives us a wonderful example. He studied everything he could get his hands on, everything he had heard orally, everybody that he could quiz and he could interview, he did this carefully and for himself. Uh, and he was writing it out for Theophilus in consecutive order. The other gospels are not necessarily chronological, nor do they need to be. Many of things that are given to us in, in the gospels are given to us by way of theme, and not necessarily this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. Sometimes they do. Uh, I love it in around Mark 6 to 8. Uh, it's one very long day, well, really a long day and part of the next one. The Lord sends his disciples out two by two in their practice preaching. They're empowered to cast out demons. They're empowered to heal the sick. They're given a message of repentance to preach, and they come back, and they are so excited and they spend all morning, they just can't talk fast enough, telling Jesus about all they've been able to experience. They commanded false, uh, you know, fallen angels out of people, demons out of people, and boom, they went. They healed people, they preached, and people listened. They were excited. And, and the Lord says, you know, you all are exhausted. We need to go for a picnic. Let's go out to the woods and just relax this afternoon. And so they go across the old Sea of Tiberias, but the people saw them going, and they outran them. And the people were on the hillside, and Jesus teaches them all day, the disciples, probably Judas, says, hey, listen, why don't we send these folks to get dinner? It's getting kind of late here. You know, it's a sundial watch, uh, like on the Flintstones. Uh, it's getting kind of late here. Why don't we send them packing? Well, no, you feed them. And uh, hey, we don't really have enough money to do that. Well, what do you have? And of course, one small boy's small lunch, and God, through Jesus, fed 5,000 men, plus their women and children. Uh, all of this happened. And then the Lord sent the disciples to row, and so they go out on the water playing row, row, row your boat against the wind all night long. He sends the crowd away because John's gospel tells us the crowd wanted to crown him king, and they were offering him kingship without the cross. And he didn't want that to happen, and he didn't want the disciples in the middle of it, and the disciples hadn't gotten the lesson just yet. And then he went up in the mountain to pray by himself. And so in the middle of the night, he comes down off the mountain, he walks on the water, scares the disciples to death. Peter says, hey, if it's you, can I join you? He comes out, he's doing fine, and then he sinks, and then he comes back in the boat with the Lord. And the scripture tells us in Mark that the disciples had not considered the miracle of the loaves and the fish. All of this happened in a day and a half, really, if you will, all of one day and half the next. And the, con the consecutive nature of it teaches us something. So sometimes they're consecutive, chronological, sometimes they're not. We can read Luke that way and be pretty safe in doing that. Um, he presents Christ as the perfect Son of Man. The phrase Son of Man is used 80-ish times in the New Testament. Uh, I believe 26 of those are in the Gospel of Luke, and uh, many of them are Jesus referring to himself. Uh, he's the Son of Adam. That is, he's human. He's human. We've talked about it in adult Sunday school uh, the last month. 
Jesus had to be human and he had to be God. He had to be both and perfectly both for his death to mean what it meant and for him to be who he is. And so his humanity shows up in the name Son of Man. Uh, he was also the promised deliverer of the book of Daniel. And so this goes to his humanity, but also to his prophecy. And so Luke gives us the Son of Man. Uh, things that make Luke distinctive. He has more distinctive, unique material than any other gospel. He's got 50% that does 50% of his long gospel doesn't show up in the other three gospels at all, or in Matthew and Mark for sure. Uh, 50% of it is unique to him, and given that they're telling the same story, that's pretty profound. Uh, again, Luke was very exact and thorough. Uh, we have it in uh, our passage here. Uh, look with me, if you would, in Luke chapter 3, as he tries to remember if he, he did. Um, just, just note the precision here, all the details in these three verses. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the re region of Iturea and Trachonitis and Lysanias, Lysan Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. That's a lot of detail. In the old world, time was told largely by who was in charge of what, where, and when. And so he gives the year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar and so forth. And so he is precise. He gets right to it. This is the way that he writes, and he does this historically in our passage, uh, chapter 3 right here, but he does it in many other ways. He was very exact. He was very thorough. Dr. Luke includes much more about the miraculous births of John the Baptist and Jesus than any other gospel writer. Uh, he tells us about the angelic announcements of Jesus and of his cousin John the Baptist, the actual account of their births he gives us for both of them. He talks about when Jesus' earthly mother visited her cousin Elizabeth, John's earthly mother. Uh, he tells us about the angels and the shepherds the night of Jesus' birth. You know, we go to Luke every year, don't we? We put the kids in cute little robes. We make some of them shepherds, some of them angels. We put a couple of them around this nice wooden manger. And, uh, you know, we read from Luke when we do that because Luke's the one who gives us the most detail. Uh, he talks about Jesus being circumcised. Again, not just recording a medical procedure. This was profound. He was a Jewish man who was raised in a Jewish world. And uh, he followed that in his own circumcision in chapter 2. Uh, the in infant Jesus being recognized by Simeon, that's going to be kind of a cool story, looking forward to that. Twelve-year-old Jesus was teaching the teachers, just love that, uh, at the end or towards the end of chapter two. Uh, for several days, mom and dad couldn't find him. They must have been panic-stricken as they made their way back. Uh, they left the extended family they were walking home with. And they went back to Jerusalem and found Jesus teaching the teachers as a 12-year-old. And he blew minds when he said, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? And he was talking to Joseph when he said it about his heavenly father, God the Father. Uh, and so Jesus educating the elders. And by the way, this is the only account of Jesus after his birth and before he's presented at 30 years old when he's baptized by John in the Jordan and starts his ministry uh, in an official way. Only Luke tells us anything about Jesus between infancy, or well, toddlerhood when the, when the wise men come, between toddlerhood and age 30, it's only Luke who tells the story. He's the only one who gives us those details at all, including the last verse of chapter two, which still blows my mind after all these years. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. To think that the God of all creation, the originator of everything we know, had to grow. He grew up physically and he grew in wisdom. Pretty profound. And as he did it, he did it very, very, very well because he grew in favor with God he was obeying God and, and read that second chapter of Philippians and see just how delighted God was in Jesus' obedience even to the cross. He is increasing in favor with God by doing what he's doing and increasing in favor with man at the very same time. 
and most of us like to think that you can't please God and man. It can happen. Jesus did it, and so we can aspire. Uh, I think he did it by being consistent and uh, by consistently loving the people around him and by being consistently honest. Um, Luke emphasizes people. Half a dozen people I give you that are not mentioned in any other book. Zacharias, Zacchaeus, you remember him, right? He was a wee little man. Uh, Elizabeth, Cleopas, Simeon, and Anna don't show up. Their stories, nothing about them shows up in any of the other books. Uh, they are unique to Luke. Luke very profoundly focuses on women more than any other book in the Bible, more than any other gospel by a large margin. Luke focuses on women. Why? He's a doctor. Most men are living their life. They're fulfilling their job. They're, they're bringing home the bacon. They're doing their manly things. And their women in their society are very much on their own to do it. Luke, as a doctor, he's got to minister to these ladies. He's got to help them in difficult times. He's got to think about pregnancy, not like, oh, she's fat, oh, she had a baby. I mean, men can be just that callous. Luke was a doctor, and he had a tender heart to the plight of women. And so he talks more about them than all the other writers. Um, he records the birth of Christ from Mary's perspective, perspective, not Joseph's like Matthew did. He gives Jesus' genealogy through Mary, not through Joseph. He mentions Elizabeth and Anna, while the other Gospels don't even mention them. And so it's going to be neat as we study to find that Luke gives more emphasis to women. And uh, there's much to be gleaned from that. And it's just natural given who he was and what he was. Luke talks about the prayer life of Jesus. We'll have entire sermons about the prayer life of Jesus. When he was on the cusp of a hard day, when he had to go to the cross, he prayed. When he was tempted with the, cro the crown without the cross, the story I gave you in, in brief a minute ago, uh, he went up in the mountain and he prayed. When he was overwhelmed with people and couldn't walk where he was going because of the crowds, he got alone and he prayed. Luke shows us a lot about the prayer life of Jesus, and there's so much for us to learn there as well. Uh, he talks about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Mary conceived by the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth, Zacharias, and Simeon all prophesied in the Holy Spirit. It was the Spirit himself who led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Spirit empowered Jesus to do the supernatural. Uh, and so there is so much here about the Spirit. Also, uh, parables and miracles. Uh, we'll find them as we come to them, and we'll delight in them when we come to them. Uh, but parables, a parable is, a, is sort of like a fable, but not. A parable is a story. It's an illustration. Uh, it, it has the idea of, of being, usually it's introdu introduced with like or as. A parable by its nature is relatable. You know, the lost coin. You ever lose something and spend all day and tear the whole house apart looking for what you lost? I am the king of that. Uh, if, if, you know, I've, I've shown guys, I've finally got the back seat of my truck pretty organized and I'm pretty proud of it. And there's men in this church that have, have seen it and, and, and they're shaking their head because pastor's entirely too proud. Well, I used to spend hours looking for stuff in my back seat. It was horrible. But I can identify with the lady with the lost coin, right? We can identify with it. A parable, I said a moment ago, is like a fable, but not. A fable doesn't have to be plausible. Icarus. Icarus used wax and feathers and made himself wings. And his daddy said to him, Icarus, don't you fly too close to the sun, son. And what does Icarus do? <laughs> yeah, what do you know, old man? And he flops his wings and he flies too high. He gets so close to the sun, it melts the wax, the feathers fall. He plummets to his end, Icarus. Could that really happen? Of course not. But parables are plausible. They don't necessarily have to be a true story. They have to be able to be a true story. It has to be plausible. It could happen. And typically, they're written to be relatable. You and I can see them because we have shared experience, and it helps the lights to come on for us. There are 22 of them in Luke's gospel, and 17 of the 22, holy 17 of them, are not in other books. That's part of why I'm excited to preach Luke is I love all those parables. I eat them up. I like them. I can identify with them. I, I find them quite preachable, and I enjoy them thoroughly. I'm looking forward to 22 parables in the book. He includes 20 miracles, six, six of which are only found here. So 
22 parables and 20 miracles. He gives us a lot to think about, a lot to delight in, and a lot to chew on. Uh, again, in his own, Luke says to Theophilus, I, I, I wanted to compile this carefully. I've made a careful study of it myself. I wanted to compile it carefully, to write it carefully, to write it in an orderly fashion, and give it to you, O Theophilus, so that you would know the truth of what you've been taught. You'd have the core truth of the gospel and who Jesus is in your very hands. And praise the Lord that he led Luke to do that. And praise the Lord there have been copies made for you and I as well. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you'd bless our study in the coming weeks and months in Luke and that uh, we would see all that you have for us. We thank you, Lord, for who Luke was and what he endeavored to do. And uh, we pray, Lord, that we would glean much from it. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for increasing our number, and as we take a moment here to welcome new folks to our membership, uh, we delight in that. We thank you for it. We give you the praise and glory for it. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would unite us all uh, as people, as fellow church members, as fellow Christians, uh, to delight in you together, to give support to each other, and, uh, Lord, to reach the lost for Christ. We pray your blessing in Christ's name.